The following presentation was recorded at the Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, please visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors for helping make these videos possible. By Oracle. Uh been working around Sun MySQL Oracle for um, God going on eleven years now, and here's my contact information. Uh, the slides are up at slideshare.net/davidmstokes. Um, that's my email and my Twitter handle. And the slide has died. Uh, safe Harbor Agreement. Oracle wants me to let you know that anything that's not officially generally available release software oops, um, is uh, anything I say about that type of software, take with a grain of salt. Uh, we might make revisions, changes, or omissions uh, in the future. But the idea is to let you know this is what we're planning on doing. And uh, unless I say it's definitely a positive 100% thing, be sure that it's going to be there. Uh, take it with a grain of salt. Might change just a little bit. So, for those of you who haven't been following MySQL, we're now 22 years old. Oracle's owned us for seven. Uh, we're doing very good at Oracle, by the way. MySQL 5.7 is our currently generally available release. It's been out for a year and a half. Uh, has a lot of interesting features like a JSON data type, uh, enhanced security, at risk, at risk, uh, at rest encryption, and much better performance. Uh, we're also decoupling some of our features away from the big server releases because they're just getting too big. Uh, here I'm talking about the document store, which allows you to do uh, create, replace, update, delete to a database without having to actually know SQL. It's uh, turning out to be a very popular feature. And group replication. This is our active, active, master, master replication. Uh, you'll also see this uh, paired with some other things like MySQL Router to give you high availability. Uh, by the way, we're hiring, and we're doing very well. So, we announced that we were going to MySQL 8. The big question for a lot of people was, what happened to MySQL 6, and what happened to MySQL 7? Well, back in the pre-Sun days, we had a version of MySQL 6. Like PHP had a version of PHP 6. Uh, had a lot of neat features, but due to some political infighting and corporate changes and all that, 6 never really came to fruition. And a lot of the neat features were backported into the MySQL 5 line. Also, the cluster series are uh, high availability, uh, active, active, master, master, geo, uh, replicate between uh, separated data centers. That was used in the 7 series, still is. Uh, it's mainly used for these things. As you move between cell phone tower and cell phone tower, your track and information is kept in a MySQL NDB uh, format database. Uh, also, these are used by a lot of the big programming uh, online games and by the U.S. Navy to run carrier flight operations. So the engineers looked at all the things you wanted to do for the next version of MySQL, and they said, you know, we're doing enough to really call it the next big release. So we're going to call it MySQL 8. As I mentioned, uh, current uh, generally available release is MySQL 5.7. Uh, cluster is now at 7.54. And as I mentioned, there was a MySQL 6 in the pre Sundays. Anyway, the, the big feature coming out is a new data dictionary. And that is enough of a big jump that engineering said, well, let's just call it number eight. So what do I mean by data dictionary? Well, if you've ever gone to your varlib, MySQL database uh, directory and looked under there, there's a whole bunch of files. Uh, you'll have one directory for every database, and then under that you'll have a, dot of, a bunch of .frms, mids, mis, opts, a uh, whole bunch of other files out there. And these are the metadata for your database. And in the old days, 20 years ago, if you lost an inode, um, as it happened often, your database went to heck, and we had a whole bunch of tools to take care of it. Well, over the past couple of years, we realized we don't really need to carry all this crud with us. We're going to put all the metadata into 
an NRDB set of tables and run it that way. Uh, by the way, when we did this to our replication information, our replication logs, uh, replication stability went way, 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 way up. So it's actually a very good thing we're doing this. The, uh, the big benefit for most of you is that you can now have millions of tables within a schema. You're no longer tied to the file system. The bad news is you can now have millions of tables within a database. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what could go wrong? Why would you ever need more than 640k to program in? Um, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, 8 bit graphics were good enough for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the. the uh, basically. Um, the other good thing is you'll be able to do alter table. And add, delete, columns, do whatever you want to do, and have it take action atomically. No longer waiting for an hour, two hours, an evening, a weekend, a week. Um, usually you're fired after a week while alter table runs. Or you have to use uh, Picona Toolkit's uh, schema tool to run this. So that will probably be the most dramatic change you'll see with MySQL 8, although if you're just a tertiary uh, user, you may not actually see that. Uh, five years ago, I think it was in this, no, I don't think it was in this room. I think it was over at the Drake Hotel. Oh, God. If, if any of you were, who have been here before, to the show before and remember the Drake Hotel, you, you're wincing a little bit. Uh, I was asked, when was MySQL going to have CTEs and windowing functions by Dr. Hip of SQLite? Well, I'd like to say we're finally going to have them. Uh, common table expressions and windowing functions um, have a lot of ex uh, uses. Uh, awesome examples here. Uh, CTEs are handy subquery-like statements. Uh, before MySQL 5.7, subqueries weren't really handled well. Uh, with MySQL uh, 8, we're doing a lot of things in temporary tables that are much more efficient, so we're able to finally get CTEs and windowing functions working. So what is a windowing function? Well, the, the keyword in a SQL statement is you'll see over. And here we're selecting name, department ID, salary, and adding up salary over a partition. And here the partition is going to be the department ID. And then for every grouping of that, you're going to have a departmental to total. So this lets you do um, sort of pivot table-ish like stuff from your information without having to try to uh, shove it into a third-party tool to do that type of work. Um, a lot of folks who are used to using this from, so like SQL Server, will tell you this has a gazillion uses. Uh, unfortunately, I grew up without this in my database and background, so I, I really am not the expert on this, but I'm slowly getting there. Um, Uh, it's sort of like a, a group by, it's kind of like, okay, here we're going to take every department ID and, and use that as our partitioning thing. Unfortunately, it's going to get confused with the data partitioning where you chop up your data into different subgroups and put them on different disk drives. So, um, um, so this example of a windowing function it's probably not the best one out there, but it's the only one I can find that, that was clear enough for a simple explanation. But the idea is you can kind of do a group by, but this is supposed to be a little more efficient, and you don't have to do the roll-ups and all the other stuff. Uh, here's another example of a windowing function. We're selecting date amount, sum of the amount, over, which is again the keyword um, from payments. And what we do is we window it where we uh, go for every date and we have a range of one week preceding and one week, uh, one week preceding what we're doing now. So you can actually go out and get breakdowns of, uh, of who's paying what when. 
Um, it's supposed to be easier to read for most people. I grew up doing that in a wear cloth. But the, the idea is you have these little windows into your data. And if you're doing data warehousing type stuff, um, you're breaking down customer shipment by quarters. You'd be able to get that more easily than having to do play date games with it. You just kind of give it the interval and away it goes. Now, common table expressions use the with keyword. So if you see a SQL statement starting with with, you automatically know it's a TTE. And uh, they're like derived tables, but the declaration is before the query. So if you're used to subqueries, where you have your main query, then the subquery underneath, flip it around, put the subquery at the top, give that an alias, and then fetch from that. So here we have uh, what's something we're calling QN for query N, and defining that as select T1 from a table, and then you do the select from QN. Uh, it's very similar to a view, and once again, I grew up without this, so I'm not the most uh, fluent person with these. Now here's a uh, an example of, of a recursive CTE, where we're actually selecting the number one, and then we go through and we actually add up from one to ten, and you can all that together and call it n. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I'm just waiting for someone to try to in, introduce a sequence that way. Let me see how that breaks. Well, our optimizer and parser team are very heavily driven engineers. Uh, they have a way they want to see the world, and they're finally getting to the point where they're getting there. Uh, in the past, if you specified a descending index. We cheated. We actually had an ascending index for you and then pulled some strings behind the, the scenes to make it look like it was a true descending index. Uh, as you can probably imagine, all those little dirty tricks that they were doing caused you performance time losses. So we fixed that. You have a true descending index. Also, the optimizer trace now has more information about file sort operations, such as uh, key sizes and payload sizes and why uh, some things are arranged the way they are. This means the optimizer is a lot smarter. It won't throw it out to a file sort if it knows it can use an index. That will speed things up. Uh, also, you can give it hints. Use this index over that. Um, use this collation over this. Makes things a lot easier. Also, um, we have a new variable that lets keeps track of Records are being deleted by another user. So as it goes through to figure out how to run your query, and it goes through and says, oh, this person is going out and deleting those records. Um, I'm going to go with the new information rather than all the statistics I had. And when that person terminates and rolls back their information, your query plan is trash. But the ser server will try to uh, run it that way. Also, um, on select statements, you can do a select no wait or a select skipped lock, locked to bypass records that are locked. So if you have something you have to get done and you know that there's going to be some records out there you may not touch and you have a way to go back and get them, uh, that's going to make life a lot easier. We're also introducing roles. Uh, roles are a collection of privileges and grants uh, for a certain function. So if you're adding a new accountant and you have an accounting role, uh, you sign them that and they get all the privileges and grants needed to do the accounting work. Uh, if you have a, a uh, QA person and you want them only locked down to the test instances, you can set that up too. Now the great news about this is Billy from accountant, accounting goes off on a six month sabbatical. You flag his account as inactive. Um, but someone else comes along and they're going to be taking Billy's job. You don't have to give them Billy's account. You say, okay, build a role like Billy, and they have the same privileges. And then when Billy comes back, you give him back his old privileges, and everything's hunky-dory. So you now have a way of saying, okay, this class of user has this set of rights 
do what they need to do. Hopefully. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of projects then, well, we'll just run everything as root and away we go and ne never worry about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, considering with, we can lock down to the column for, for read privileges uh, now uh, or update privilege, um, we should be able to get more of this. Yes, sir. Uh, that's why a lot of people have used views before. We can say this view runs as this user with this set of privileges. But hopefully with roles, we'll be able to make this a little more flexible. Say, okay, they're the accounting group. This is accounting information. This should be all this. So, knock on wood. Uh, if you don't have permission to read a column, the editor's back and says you don't have permission to read this column. Uh, I'd have to check the index code because I'm not sure if the index carries the same permission as the actual column, but it should. So, something I'll have to go take a look at. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all the system tables are now in InnoDB. Um, previously, these were all in MyISAM, non transactional. Um, so, Technically, you could have several people updating user information at the same time, which um, it has potential. It has potential to blow up in your face, so uh, be careful. Oh yeah. Uh, the trouble with ORMs is you're always adding at least two layers of abstraction whenever you use one. And usually it's faster if you just learn to write SQL in the original place. Uh, it's also a less, uh, lessens the layer complexity. But, uh, here we're just talking about the system tables, especially the proof tables, um, multiple people being able to play with them at the same time. Yes. Yeah, um, whatever thing I'm talking about, unless I explicitly say this is the enterprise only, is the community version. Uh, big change that will probably hit most of you is MySQL 8 will you be will be UTF-8 MB4. Now, 15 years ago, I used to compile my MySQL to use only Latin 1. It's a one-bit character set. Um, Without a lot of correlations of different character sets, it actually ran marginally faster in a smaller memory footprint. Great. Well, why has that changed 15 years later? Well, because everyone wants to put the poop emoji in their data someplace. And to do that fully and to get support for all the Oriental languages, we need UTF MB4. Also, uh, people jumping on the JSON bandwagon will tell you that everything has to be UTF MB4. So to make life easier for us, everything's going to be UTF-8 MB4, which I will not be able to see after three drinks. Um, previously, our UTF-8 was three bytes instead of three buys. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so that didn't mean, that meant no emojis. Also, the uh, supplemental multilingual plane support was kind of weak. And we did have a lot of support for... Uh, the Chinese, Japanese, Korean ideograph extensions, but they're all in MB4 rather than just before. Also, MySQL, as so far as I know, is also the only database that supports the GB18030 character set, which is the official character set for China. So, if you're saying Ni Hao at the start of half of your conversations, you're going to want to switch to that. 
The other thing with UTF is, as, as in the past, we've always had case insensitive and case sensitive collations of data. Uh, you're also going to now have a accent insensitive version of the same thing. So instead of just case sensitive, case insensitive, now you're going to have accent sensitive and insensitive. Invisible index. First time I heard of this feature, it kind of made me uh, wonder what they were talking about. When you're profiling a MySQL uh, query, the traditional way to uh, see what the optimizer wants to do is put the word explain in front of that query. And it comes back with a whole bunch of information, tells you what indexes it wants. Well, sometimes you don't know if that index is helping you or not. And what you could do is delete that index, uh, run explain on that query again, and find out, yes, that is a very valuable index, and then spend all weekend rebuilding that index. What we've done with 8 is you can now type alter index, da 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 da, invisible. And suddenly the optimizer cannot see that. So you run your explain and it comes, you can compare the before and after results to see if your query plan is any better for you. Uh, if it is, maybe you blow away that query or that index. Um, maybe you don't. But this gives you a way to definitively test for it. How many of you are running MySQL in the cloud? Who is it? <laughs> Well, what happens in cloud environments or environments where you have lots of people adjusting the server is that someone changes a variable, someone else changes another variable, and then reboot time comes six weeks, eight weeks, six months, a year later, and things run like heck, and you can't figure out why. I remember changing a variable. You know, I changed a variable. Well, what did you change? I don't remember. Well, what did you change it to? I don't remember. Well, with set persist, it will take that change and it will write it out there to a, a log file, a uh, .cnf file, uh, which we call MySQL D.auto, and the information's out there. So when the server reboots, it knows that this change was made and implements. It also logs who did it and at what time. So if you're changing something at 8 a.m. in the morning to get better performance and the night shift comes in, they change it back. Um, you can actually track that down. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we realized the uh, server releases by themselves are getting larger and larger and larger, and it's getting harder and harder to swallow the elephant in one pipe. Um, we also know that there's a lot of stuff in the cloud that you can't actually go change the major release number or the minor release number. So what we're doing is we're decoupling a lot of our features and making them plugins. So you, as root or some other super privileged user, go in, install a shared object, boom, that new feature is working. Uh, now we've done this with group replication, uh, document store, um, our uh, handler socket uh, type thing that we call um, uh, forget the name, but it actually writes straight to the uh, NODB data store without going through the optimizing parser for SQL. So if you have any, if you ever see our new software coming out, and uh, we're trying to make things more modular, uh, be advised we'll try it on the current release by just installing the plugin. But we're trying to make things much more modular than they are currently. Um, I love that quote from Governor Schwarzenegger. Well, up until 5.6 and 5.7, our GIS support was pretty bad. And uh, as I told Jim earlier, I had some friends that said, hey, once you guys get to 2D support, we'll dump post GIS and go over to MySQL totally. Well, with 5.7, we had 2D support. And it uh, works pretty good. Unfortunately, we live in a 3D world. So by working with the Boost Geometry folks and OpenGID, we're going to be able to give you a world that is uh, curved, and the coordinate system will wrap around, and um, 
you'll be able to say, okay, I'm at location X within three miles of me. Where's all the pizza joints? Where's all the ATMs? Um, you know, whatever else I want to be able to do. So this work is going to be done at the InnoDB storage engine layer, not at the top level MySQL server layer. So we're pushing down a lot of that work down to the storage engine, which should make it more efficient and quicker for you. Uh, one of the reasons a lot of folks have switched to MySQL 5.7 has been the JSON column type. Um, previously, before 5.7, you could store JSON data in a text string. The only trouble is you couldn't do stuff with it in place. You couldn't update, you couldn't delete, you couldn't search for certain things without using regexes. And they were, uh, it was pretty nasty. Well, 5.7 has been very popular. A lot of developers have uh, demanded switches over, switch over to it. So companies have upgraded to 5.7 to get to the JSON column. Now, as more and more people use it, we start realizing that there is a, um, a need for shortcuts. When you pull something from a JSON column, it usually comes out in quotes. So um, we came up with an arrow operator to let you do JSON. The, uh, the stuff in blue where it says JSON extract my column. If you go down the second line, you can see... Um, my column arrow operator dollar dot my path dollar is kind of like a here operator for the current document and my path is the the object you're searching for. Well, we now have a double arrow operator that inc that pulls the quotes off that, so you don't have to strip it off with some other program. Uh, we also came up with a uh, beautifier for JSON. Uh, if you have heavily nested JSON data. It gets very messy to read on a command line. Uh, so we actually have a JSON underscore pretty command that goes through and beautifies it. Uh, you can also aggregate arrays. So if you know you have um, some data, here we have um, select column from T1. You can see that we have one record that starts with key one, another one starts with key A. And here we'll actually aggregate all that information and put it into an array. Uh, if you're not used to playing with JSON, it's rather messy because you have arrays within objects, you can have objects within arrays. Uh, it's kind of a who's on first situation. It gets very messy. But if you have a bunch of data you need to output in an array format, this will do it for you. And of course, we have the object version or analog of that where we have the information um, in a, in a uh, row of data. Uh, here we have a uh, probably an integer and then the JSON column and we have an ID of one and two for the uh, integers. And we say, okay, we're going to make a object aggregating all the information from T1 and we get that all out in one object. Uh, unless you're doing a lot of processing with JSON, that's probably not going to make you go, wow. If you are, that saves you a lot of time. So let's create a table called JTable. It has one column in it of type JSON. And into that JTable, we insert the data you see there on the uh, second uh, bolded line. And then we come out and we say, okay, how much information is in there? Now, right now, the way it's written, your limitation is the maximum packet size into the MySQL server. Um, you heard the thing of 10 pounds of you know what in a five pound sack. Well, the, the choke point here is actually the network packet going through there. And ironically, you can actually have uh, a JSON document in memory larger than that size. Unfortunately, to write it out to disk and store it, it's going to have to be that size. That size is roughly a gigabyte. Uh, once again, I know a gigabyte's big, but as I said earlier, we used to be told you didn't need more than 640k to program in. Uh, by the way, if you need more than a gigabyte of JSON data, two columns of JSON data or more. Um, that, unfortunately, that's not always obvious. So we've had a couple of supporting uh, functions. JSON storage size and JSON storage free to tell you how much you're consuming 
and how much you're freeing up as you do various operations. Uh, at this point, I don't expect a lot of people of using this. Uh, two years from now, I'm sure I'm going to have someone saying, well, I've got all my, my friends and my emojis, and I'm trying to save it out there, but it gets telling me it's too big. How do I find out how big it really is? That's the... So, um, please go out and test this today. Uh, it's available for Windows, Linux, Macs. Uh, also, the source code is out there. And this is all the community version. Uh, if you want to test the enterprise version, I don't know if we have the enterprise version. I have this out for test right now. Uh, download it, try the tires. If you find a bug, please submit a bug report. If um, you don't really want to if you want to try one or two things with it, you can go out and get Docker images or Vagrant, uh, um, Vagrant or um, VirtualBox images of it and play with it. Now, well, one of my uh, counterparts from the uh, server team actually has gone out there and created the unofficial MySQL guide where he goes into Lots of details about everything I've been I've just been highlighting today. Um, good details on how the server architecture is changing with the data dictionary. So if you want to see how they're doing atomic alter tables, he goes into details about that. Uh, also, B plus tree indexes. Uh, MySQL traditionally has used B tree indexes, but B trees are coming in for some things like a lot of the uh, GIS information. Uh, it talks about the changes in explain and optimizer trace. Um, we're also making changes to the optimizer. Uh, with the way MySQL figures out how to best run a query is it goes through statistics and figures out, okay, it's going to cost me X to get where to get this information. It's like a, G I, it's like a uh, GPS in your car. Uh, the only trouble is, um, as you know, if you've ever run into a traffic jam, it's just 20 minutes down the road according to your GPS. Traffic jam is reality. You have an hour of wait before you even get to the part where it's starting to count the 20 minutes. So there's some uh, things are changing on the optimizer. Also with the optimizer, it used to be based on the cost of reading a piece of information off a disk. Reading something off a disk is 100,000 times slower than reading it out of memory. Well, what if you have the same information in two locations? One of them is a super a solid state disk and the other one uh, is a spinning disk. Well, this will know uh, which one's the more cost-effective ones to go through. Also, talk more about the uh, the uh, hints to the optimizer, where you force it to use various indexes. Um, also, talks about the improvements we made in subquery CTEs and views, and um, query rewrite. If you know someone's writing bad queries in their code, but you can't get them to change them, you can actually have the server change it for you on the fly. So if you really want more details, uh, see me afterwards or go through this. So um, this is just an overview of eight. Um, I want to do plenty of time for Q&A, or uh, if you want to see it in action, we can go back to the MySkilled booth and uh, take a look at that. So. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, as I said, the slides are up. And uh, actually, the, the blog should be elephantdolphin.blogger.com, not elephant and dolphin. But with that, um, if you have any other questions about this or anything MySQL related, uh, I can answer it. If it's Oracle related, I might be able to answer it, but don't hold me to that. So, so are we going the right way with eight? Is it going to fix a lot of your problems? You're happy with it? Yes, sir. Uh, you actually now do output equals JSON. And uh, that's been out since 5.7. So, yes, sir. How many rows? Um, it's more dependent on what the type of row and, and how much. You're usually limited to, I think right now, like 250 columns. So the number of rows probably depends more on your disk space than anything else.